Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Flywheel Pod. I'm your host, DeFi Dave, and I'm here with Capital K. And we just finished up a great episode with Vesta. Very informative. Kit, what did you think? Man, I think Vesta Finance is a key example of what a Frax partner is like, right? It's yeah. a symbiotic relationship and it's helping Frax expand onto Arbitrum and, and, and things like that. I think it was a really good episode. Symbiotic, positive sum, very capable, very smart team. They know exactly what they're doing. And I was really excited about all the alpha that they were dropping with everything they're developing with their V2, how they plan to go to other chains and how they plan to utilize you know, those other chains as well. Dude, especially during this like kind of bear market. And I think they still have the always be shipping mentality, which yeah. is like commendable, you know? Bears are for the builders. Bears are for the builders. Yep. And just remember, if please subscribe to us. We're at 250 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Twitter, at FlywheelPod, and also uh, on Telegram, at FlywheelPod. All right, everyone. Here we have Mikey, the co-founder of Vesta. Vesta is a multi-collateralized stablecoin built natively on Arbitrum. Mikey, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? Doing pretty well myself. It's I'm not going to lie. It's pretty hot in Lisbon. Pretty pretty damn humid, but uh, hanging in there. And Kit, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. This, this is actually quite um, serendipitous because where I first met Mikey was in Lisbon. As oh, really? Like, yeah, exactly. With uh, Eat Lisbon. Oh, yeah. damn. I was there too. Was that the same event that me and you were at, Kit? Like that one, like the first days? No, no, no. Actually, it was closer um, to the end. It was the Sino event. Oh, no. It was the Solana e event, Mikey. That's was that right? Was it was, it was during was... Solana Breakpoint Week. And, uh, there you go. Uh, uh, week. Yeah. I wasn't there for that one. I remember now. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. How time has really changed. Since then, since October, November last year. Yeah, yep. we all became a lot poorer. That's what. Yeah. <laughs> you, know what you know what we did? We started a podcast. We, we became poor. We got bored. And it's like, you know what? Let's create content for the people to survive this next cycle of the market. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Man, yeah. that's, that's so funny. As the summer heats up, the market just freezes over. You know, it's funny. I, I was realizing this like last year around this time, the market was in a quote unquote quote bear and so and a lull like going into uh, ETH Paris and ETH CC. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's like a similar situation again. And it's just like, all right, like who's left? Who's left this time around? Yeah, facts, facts. Um, Mikey, are, are you going to go to uh, ETH CC? I'm not so sure yet. Um... I'll see. I'll see. Uh, if you do, you're, you're, you're invited to my birthday party. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm throwing a I'm rave. Like... <laughs> so, like, if you do, yeah. like, come through. Dave gets lit. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, let's let's jump right into it. Uh, Mikey, can you give, like, a little bit of background on yourself? Like, how'd you get into crypto and how'd you end up starting Vesta? Yeah, sure. So, um um, during undergrad, I, I was first doing um, finance, and so I, you know, was very attracted, basically very attracted to all of the, um, uh, like, the traditional route of breaking into finance, which is, like, investment banking and so on and so forth. And I started, uh, got a bit disillusioned, so started picking up computer science. And when I learned about crypto, I, I think this is back in second or third year, or I, I think, like, uh, it's been, like, six, seven years by now. Um, I was just uh, basically, uh, it, it really clicked for me. So, um, you know, uh, financial um, industry combined with uh, my newly acquired computer science background. Um, so that's kind of how I got, a start, got, got started in crypto. Um, so really paid attention to it. Right after graduating, I dived straight into a, um, a blockchain, a layer, layer one company. Um, spent a year there and then transitioned to one of the most popular UI product um, in crypto. Uh, you know, there's only a couple, so you can probably guess which one. And uh, yeah, so I spent another uh, year and year and a half over there, um, got really 
I was effectively the guy who integrated a lot of protocols. So, you know, if you go on, say, like Zap or DBank, you see all these protocols that, um, you know, your uh, DJ money has uh, gone into. I was kind of the guy who was going into these protocols, checking out a smart contract and hooking up, you know, the balances for all the DJs to see. And uh, it was a great time. I learned quite a bit. Um, but over time, I kind of realized I, I wanted to, um, you know, truly uh, utilize my, um, my interest in finance a bit further. And so I started looking into more liquidity focused problems. And, and so um, that's why I got it started, uh, got it started with uh, Vesta. So yeah. yeah. I'm curious, uh, with your time at this UI company, you said you went in, you checked out a bunch of smart contracts, a bunch of projects, like, what are some things that you noticed about those projects? And, uh, yeah, what are some things that you noticed? Yeah, I think, um, one of the things that a lot of people kind of assumed, um, when I told them about the position I was in is that they, they all thought that I was the first into all these projects. Um, but in reality, what happened was I didn't really spend a lot of time um, really diving into the, uh, you know, the, the, the true kind of mechanism behind them. I was more like trying to hash out um, as many of these protocols as possible. So one of the distinction that uh, one of the, one of the, I guess, um, most memorable thing that I took away from from this this uh, this job as a whole is that you know you can be an engineer, but ultimately you also need to spend a lot of time on designing the mechanism, designing the um, you know how things work, and implementation and brainstorming are just very very different things. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, so I think uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> that's kind of the 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 kind of describes sums up my time there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, were there any protocols that like stuck out to you and you could like just tell like, oh, like this is like a quality project or like, oh, like this one's kind of overrated or, oh, this is underrated? Um, nothing quite stood out, but I guess the interesting thing I, I observed is, um, you know, there's this recent EIP called 4626. Mm, uh, the vaults, where, yeah. Uh, yeah, like a tokenized mm. vault thing. Um, the, the thing is a lot of projects were already using that, uh, even before this thing became a standard. Um, so I, I think, uh, so once I kind of learned about 4626, I was like, Hey, like this is basically what people all use anyway, because they all forked yarn. And so, you know, they, <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I don't see, uh, what, what they did is effectively put it into writing like you know the the eip standard but um from implementation perspective a lot of projects were already using that so yeah oh i did not yeah, realize I, that yeah and and mikey when you were kind of like fishing for all of these contract addresses and such like did you notice the projects with good documentation are the ones that gather like the largest tvl or do you see almost like an inverted relationship I think um, good documentation definitely correlates with um, uh, the amount of confidence that people have on a, uh, in a protocol, right? Like if, if the documentation is, it makes sense, first of all, and it, it's well written and it's, you know, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's very clear that people put a lot of thoughts into it. Um, in that way, it's, it shows to the people that they, you know, the project owners, the project creators, they put a lot of thoughts into um, creating the project. And, but most importantly, you know, it, it has to be like, it can't just be something that, oh, you put a lot of thoughts into it. It has to really make sense. And so ultimately, I think it comes down to the product, but I think it definitely serves as a positive signal if it's well written. Got it. Okay. That goes against the uh, usual DGEN ideology of eight first read later. So docs matter, everybody. Work on your documentation. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to, to pivot real quick and ask you to share a little bit about like, what is Vesta Finance? 
Yeah, so so Vesta right now is um, basically a uh, stablecoin um, that uh, it's quite similar to you know think like Liquidity and Maker and Abracadabra. Um, these protocols um, they all kind of utilize different mechanism uh, when it comes to creating private form of money. In the case of Maker, it's Dai. In the case of Liquidity, it's LUSD. Uh, case of Abracadabra is MIM. For us. What our stablecoin is called is called Vesta Stable, so VST. Um, the way I see all of these protocols is that we are all issuers of private money, right? Like uh, um, this is actually very legal in the United States, not something that people actually, uh, but but it's not adopted widely due to how widely circulating uh, USD is. But this has not been the case always. Um, this has been uh, like due to um regulations usd is now the most widely circulating but at one point in history private money was more um uh, more widely circulating than uh national issue currency so um relative to other protocols i think the um, biggest competitive advantage we offer is um we offer fairly low collateralization ratios compared to um, other protocols uh, that effectively do the same thing. Um, it's It all comes down to capital efficiency, uh, especially uh, with, um, you know, different types of collateral that are available out there. People are always looking for uh, the place where they can utilize the most out of their buck. And so that's the way that we've approached it. And that's kind of the current form of Vesta, but going forward, we're we're going to um, we're currently devising a lot of mechanism to um, you know maybe utilizing the collateral and and conduct uh, farming operations similar to you know what uh, Frax is doing, um, conducting more um, liquidity pool based operations such as uh, such as AMOs like um, from Frax. Um, a lot of things that we're looking into, a lot of things we're currently building. Um, effectively expanding beyond just a, uh, you know, asset-based uh, collateralization, um, uh, debt collateral or CDP um, protocol, right? Going beyond, going above and beyond that. So, yeah. I guess um, you said that, uh, I remember hearing a podcast in the past that you were on that Vesta is most similar to liquidity in structure, especially when it first started off. Can you go? Well, can you go over like what are the differences in structure between like liquidity and maker? Like what makes them different, and how does Vesta differentiate from those two? Yeah. So um, currently, um, uh, the liquidation me liquidation mechanism um, that Vesta utilizes is actually uh, similar to. Um, what liquidity utilizes. So um, the mechanism we utilize is a structure called stability pool. Instead of relying on external capital like Maker to, uh, instead of relying on external capital to liquidate underwater positions, um, the the structure that we utilize when it comes to liquidation is we, we ask people to put money into a stability pool and then the money from the stability pool is then um, used to instantly liquidate um, underwater positions. So this uh, alleviates uh, a couple a couple issues. First of all, is a timing issue, right? So with Maker, you have to wait up to a, an hour. You have this one hour window to liquidate. And then you most importantly have to rely on other people to come in to liquidate for you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with, with the, uh, another issue that it alleviates is Oracle problem. Um, with um, external liquidators, they might be utilizing an Oracle that's different from the one that these CDP protocols are quoting from. And so, you know, they, they in the end, it might, e might even be unprofitable. And so with a stability pool, what it ensures is the Oracle and the liquidation price. Or Oracle that liquidation kind of um, uses as well as the actual liquidating uh, price is always the same. 
So um, in my opinion, it's just a much better mechanism. That's why we, we inherited it from liquidity. Um, and uh, yeah, so for our V2, we are expanding beyond that. Um, we're actually going to, um, we're, we're looking into making liquidity uh, or rather making the stability pool just one part of the liquidation model. Um, so for more versatile assets, we're also looking to build a auction model based uh, liquidation engine as well. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Do you think in the future, like this, like you mentioned the collateral, you're thinking about doing AMOs with the collateral. Would you do the same thing with the stability pool as well? Yeah. So the stability pool could be very versatile, right? Like it's just, uh, when it's not liquidating anything, it's just sitting there. So this pool yeah. of money, uh, could be, um, could, you could divert portion of that towards say, you know, making, uh, market making, right. Um, or, you know, provide providing that out as, uh, as a loan of some sort. These are, these are all possible. This is actually what, um, I believe, uh, a fellow project is working on, um, I forgot the name of their, I forgot which one exactly. I, I think it's either NDX or, or, uh, or, uh, whichever one, but this is something that we are also working on in-house as well, um, where, you know, people will not only gain from liquidation, but they also will uh, earn maybe yield or fee generated from, you know, liquidity pools. Makes sense. Makes sense. And then I saw that when you first launched uh, Vesta, you were part of um, Olympus's incubator launchpad program, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And then you also partnered up with Frax and I think recently something with GMX as well. That's right, yeah. So like, you know, from your experience partnering up with, with all these DAOs, like did you always want it to start that from the very beginning to be a very integral part of the DeFi ecosystem? Yeah, I think so. I think that's something that um, we are, uh, we haven't put a bunch of focus on lately, but at the start, it was, I would say, one of the uh, reasons why we did get a fair bit of traction was because of our successful partnership campaign. Um, we did, you know, f we, we were fortunate enough to become one of the um, first project that Frax partnered with on Arbitrum. We were part of the Olympus Incubator Program. Um, uh, I think to this day, if you go to Frax Staking, I think the VST pool is the first one that shows up. <laughs> I don't really nice. know. Yeah, I don't really know why that is, but um, I think you know uh, uh, we're we we definitely are. Um, we definitely do take the approach of um, placing uh, our partners, uh, or rather, just seeing the partnership division as something that we uh, really emphasize. Putting a, putting a lot of efforts on. So, so how did you go about choosing these partners? Well, I think a lot of it was, um, you know, uh, I would say it's a combination of reputation as well as introduction, as well as, you know, the harder metrics such as TVLs and this and that, right? Um, Frax being one of the largest stablecoin uh, protocols, it, it made a lot of sense for us to um, partner with it. And, uh, at the start, it also, we, we did get, um, some support from, from Sam from Frax himself as well. Uh, he was able to direct some incentive toward the pool. And, uh, that really helped us, that really helped us bootstrap, um, the initial liquidity of VST paired with Frax. Interesting. And then do you ever have, um, cause obviously Vesta is a stable coin protocol and project mm -hmm. and Frax mm -hmm. is also another stable coin, uh, project. Do you ever think about competition or do you think it's more of like cooperation? In the current stage is definitely cooperation, right? I think that, um, you know, Frax has built such an amazing ecosystem that we are, um, fortunately a part of and, um, I would, I would go as far as saying that like the, 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 there isn't necessarily any, uh, uh, competition in view at all due to how, 
how how much smaller Vesta is compared to Frax at the moment. Because you know, it, it, it it's a we we are focusing on very high quality um, collateral. We don't really onboard. Um, um, you know, things that are more centralized uh, at the moment. Um, so with Frax is, you know, that is uh, fundamentally um, different, I would say, right? Like uh, Frax takes a very uh, philo- uh, different philosophy when it comes to uh, what is backing their uh, stable coin and this and that. And for, for us, we, we think that, um, you know, we, we want to ensure uh, the security of our protocol in the long run, well, at least in the short short term, uh, in as well as um, what we've done so far, right? Like we we haven't yet onboarded uh, anything uh, similar to what Frax has done. So it's uh, in a way, it's very different philosophy, and that's why I think that we have sustained this traction because we have people who are um, aware of you know the way that we approach uh you know decentralization and so forth so yeah and what's it like working in the arbitrum ecosystem um why did you choose it and how do you think it has evolved uh since uh vesta first launched i think it is definitely one of the most um thriving ecosystems um i i would i would go as far as I would go as far as to to say that um, it is, you know, there hasn't been a lot of incentive from the ecosystem itself, um, different from a lot of um, other ecosystems, such as, uh, um, I, I guess I shouldn't name names, but you know, a lot of L1s, they mm-hmm. they definitely, um, they they not only build a good infrastructure, but they go as far as you know rewarding uh, economically as well. Um, but that hasn't been the case with Arbitrum, right? Like, uh, I think that has been the case, but, but the number is like, um, 10 degrees smaller, almost, uh, it's uh, much, much less for the projects that they onboard. So a lot of projects that onboard into the Arbitrum ecosystem, they're truly attracted by maybe the user experience, you know, the quality of fellow builders and so on and so forth. Um, we've, we've, uh, you know, we talk to GMX all the time. We've had AMA with them. We've had AMA with Dopex as well. All of these fellow builders on Arbitrum are all very friendly and welcoming in terms of, you know, exploring collaboration and and offering help. So, um, you know, I think it's definitely one of the better ecosystem to develop in right now. Yeah, and it definitely seems like a lot of projects that are purely Arbitrum native. Um, I think the most, most so honestly, out of all the rollups and chains I've seen that aren't just merely forks, uh, like you guys native to Arbitrum, GMX, Dopex, Umami, um, so many great projects and a lot of, you know, high quality teams just building on there Mm -hmm, and without even any incentives, you know? Yeah. 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 I think that, uh, we, 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 um, I, I definitely, uh, think that it is also a viable strategy to, you know, uh, hunt for grants and incentives and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you, you kind of open yourself up to, uh, uh, to kind of, you know, you're kind of pegged to that ecosystem uh, at that point. And, um, I think we have more leverage uh, in this, in this regard, like we can go wherever we want, wherever that makes sense. Uh, in the current phase, uh, as long uh, since we haven't yet uh, fully fleshed out uh, v two, um, we we are we're currently we're, we'll just stay on Arbitrum and it's been just fine for us. God, do you see a future for Vesta where it's multi chain? Yeah, fully. I think that um, you know we want to expand the use, expand the supply of VST. Um, as much as we can. And, um, you know, that would definitely entail uh, capturing, you know, the, 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 the collateral, the revenue from other ecosystem as well. Got it. Would you be afraid of like fragmented stability pools since you guys have to handle the liquidation pretty much in-house? 
Yeah, so the way that we are approaching, um, uh, the way that we are approaching cross chain minting is the collaterals. They will, the collaterals, and basically there won't be any、um, tokens that you won't, you can't track the source to, you know.、Um, Effectively, you know, if if something is getting liquidated, we'll always be able to trace it back to the people who opened it,、um, and then, you know, deal with it accordingly that way. Maybe, it may be someone who、uh, minted from Arbitrum and they minted directly onto Ethereum. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a kind of a, a, a kind of a sneak peek of our V two, which is、uh, cross chain minting. Oh, that sounds cool!、Ooh. Alpha alert. So I could, I could have my collateral on one chain, and then mint it on another. Yes, yes, correct. Dope.、Um, I guess like the tricky part about that is the oracles cross chain. It's just like how can you make sure that you know your position is still solvent? Yeah, yeah. So that's something we're we're、uh, still looking into. I'd say, but. Uh, in terms of the engineering kind of implementation, we definitely have、uh, moved forward with making a couple of assumptions. That's actually、uh, something I think we were talking to Chainlink about,、um, mm. but、uh, we'll be we'll be、uh, you know making some progress there for sure. Coming soon. With with the market kind of you know drawing down these these past couple months, like how did Vesta's liquidation mechanism perform. It、uh, it works really well.、Um, all the stability pools have been. They were none of them, you know, were depleted, and liquidation all happened、um, very quickly. And、um, we also pushed out an update to our liquidation. Originally, our liquidation engine was. You can almost say uh, uh, overly harsh on the、um, people who opened、uh, mm-hmm. vaults,、um, but we have made the modification to separate、um, bonus to liquidators、um, compared to. So basically, a lot of collaterals can be retrieved by the vault openers now.、Um, once you do get liquidated, and、uh, yeah, I think、uh, you know the system works just fine. Um, and our token has been currently the issue is actually overpeg, and so we 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 we're creating a, a arbitrum, not arbitrum, a arbitrage bot to、um, arb down the,、mm. uh, the premium back to zero,、uh, back to one. Yeah, got it. And the premium being like is、um, VST is trading above a dollar. That's right. Yeah, it's currently trading at one point oh oh eight. I think. Oh, that's not bad. That's <laughs> not bad, but you know, we wanted to kind of go back to one. So hopefully, yeah, that's true. Happen soon. Yeah. Do you find it, you know, at that number a lot, and it's just like, okay, we need to like make sure, make like make a way for it to go down to that level. Hence the arbitrage bot. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we,、uh, we, we, we've、um, opened redemption to the people, and now basically there is. It's impossible to be lower than point nine nine five. It could it could even be a, a tighter peg if we lower the redemption fee.、Um, so now we're we're trying to tackle the、um, the premium problem.、Um, it is not a big problem, I would say, but you know、mm-hmm. we'll、uh, we'll resolve. Better、it. to nip it in the bud now. Yeah, yeah, exactly.、Um, I have a question: Is there contingency plans if, let's say, the stability pool is depleted? Is there like a plan B, or what is supposed to happen if if that ever were to happen? Yeah. So、um, the mechanism that kicks in after stability pool is depleted is、um, redistribution. Basically,、um, the debt is actually redistributed to the rest of Um, the people who still have positions, not only the debt but also the collateral. So,、um, people effectively take on a bit 
more collateral and an even bit, uh, even even more bit of uh, uh, debt as well. Sorry, I got it reversed. A bit of debt, but even more of collateral to the rest of the uh, people still in the ecosystem. So the system will be intact, but um, you know the it's just the the uh, the rest of the vault openers will uh, see a bit of money, uh, both asset and liability. So, oh wait, so like well, their collateral and their debt increases after right, the yeah. 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 Well, how, oh, I guess like, I'm trying to figure out how that like works. Yeah, like, yeah. why why does it work like that? Can you walk through an example? Yeah. So basically, if say that I get liquidated and there's no longer a liquidity pool, um, uh, capital say that you originally had, you know, um, uh. $150 worth of ETH and $100 worth of um, debt, uh, VST. Um, mm -hmm. If I get liquidated at 110 and $100, 100, 110 worth of ETH and $100 worth of VST, um, effectively, you know, um, the $150, now your $150 worth of um uh, collateral is going to become 260. Uh, so your collateral has increased and then your debt doubles to 200. So you took oh, on more collateral so, and more debt basically. Oh, so you, you basically kind of recycle the debt. I mean, your collateral into like a new position. So it's like not a $150 position anymore, but it's a $260 collateral position but your debt increases with that. And That's right. that continues, like basically you keep on like rolling over until you just have like a bunch of debt that you need to pay off. Well, it's just, it's, it would be redistributed to everyone uh, equally. Um, uh, so it would be, you know, marginal difference, but it's still somewhat of an increase. I guess wait, what's, wait, what's being redistributed, the collateral is being redistributed to all the, uh, Stability pool stakers, you're saying? To all the non stability, not stability oh. pool stakers, but the vault openers. Yeah. Oh, vault openers. So if I open a yeah. vault, okay, so if I'm taking out debt and somebody gets liquidated without the stability, when the stability pool is depleted, then that collateral yeah. that's getting liquidated is distributed to all the vault owners. And at the same time, yeah. your collateral and debt increase. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. I see. Okay. Is okay. This, so is this huh. how liquidity works too, or is, is, did you make up this? Did you create this yourself? This is how, yeah, this is also a model that we inherited from liquidity as well. Got um, it. Yeah. So, so this is, I would say, um, uh, I think the design principle that they follow is that they don't want to deal with external capital at all. They don't want to deal with auction at all. Mm -hmm. um, I would um, go as far as saying that uh, uh, it's not necessary to fully prevent outside capital. Um, I think a, a auction model, um, works quite often. And so, you know, what, what we are currently working on is, um, potentially devising an auction model as well before, you know, stability pool gets, gets utilized. Um, I think Euler has a, uh, a model where they i think the amount of reward increases over time or rather the amount of um like liquidation bonus increases over time and so you know that's that's another model that we are looking at and i think that is extremely attractive to you know auction based um, um liquidation and uh so yeah cool we're really getting deep into Vesta here. I yeah, love it. really. <laughs> uh, so let's let, let's take a step back and let's talk about the uh, Frax partnership uh, in in general. Like, uh, how was it like uh, being a Frax partner? What were some challenges and benefits? I think being a Frax partner, we um, we received a ton of support from from Sam. Um, like I said, he gave us. Uh, liquidity incentive uh, at the very start helped us bootstrap the pool. Um, 
and most importantly, I think, uh, uh, I, I think like that's you know uh, the most critical thing when you're trying to bootstrap a, a new token, right? Um, and uh, over time, we also have fellow angels who support um, via voting uh, their VE frax toward our pool. Um, I think the most prominent one. And the one that we're still relying on today is uh, Tetranode. Um, he he has put forth a, a fair chunk of his VE uh, frac share toward um, our our pool, and so yeah, that's I would say like majority of of uh, VST liquidity um, is you know supported by a, a bunch of our angels as well. So you know. Um, I would say that uh, because of how mature the ecosystem is, you know, you have all these uh, DeFi veterans who, who, uh, who are deep in the frag system, who, who could um, effectively lend support to a new project through that way. I see. So you're saying not only is the quote official partnership with Frax, you know, comes with Frax support, but all the Frax whales and the DeFi veterans, as you call it, who are part of the Frax ecosystem also supports Vesta. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. That's sweet. And, and uh, I was going to ask, uh, you talked about voting with a VE FXS tokens. Has Vesta at all, you know, participated in any of the Frax wars and uh, done any vote incentives with either Pitch or Vodium or Hidden Hand? Yeah, so we um, we used we utilized hidden hands. I think this was uh, I think um, two almost two months ago. Uh, at this point, that was the first um, first bribe that we conducted. Um, but for the recent periods, what we've been doing is um, um, not only relying on Tetrano, but we um, are currently directly talking to Tetrano about. Um, you know, sending him uh, Vesta directly and so on and so forth. Oh, it's so, just straight up sending him the Vesta. Yeah, yeah. So it's like more of a OTC kind of bribe instead of utilizing the uh, the the democratized bribing systems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That would be an interesting feature for these platforms, just OTC bribe for f- facilitation. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I hope Charlie's taking notes here. Yeah, no, <laughs> and then um, so those are good things. But what are some of the challenges in in being a Frax partner? Um, I think that Frax on Arbitrum is not uh, is a factory pool. Um, so from a user experience perspective, people uh, like the curve itself is already hard hard enough to use, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, like uh, now you have to ask people to take the extra step to click see all pools uh, instead of having the Frax pool being populated right on the front page. Uh, by default, I think the front page doesn't populate factory pools. And so, you know, uh, we we effectively have to devise user experience um, from the ground up. Well, that's technically what we're doing in, in-house. We, you know, we, we're trying our best to... Um, get FRAC supported on all the uh, aggregators, liquidity aggregators, um, DEX aggregators, I meant. And, uh, you know, like give people a smoother user experience when they want to, you know, go from BST to FRAX to back to USDC or ETH or whatever they're based off of. Would, uh, is Vesta considering pairing to the FRAX base pool at all? Um, I don't think we've initiated the conversation there, um, but uh, for now, I think we uh, we're, we're definitely open to that idea um, because whatever can make the user experience better, we we're definitely open to explore that. And what would you say uh, Frax's footprint in Arbitrum's like? Not just with you guys and the Curve Factory pool, but overall. I think overall, it's um, um, I would say that it definitely is stronger on, say, mainnet, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, 
um, as well as, you know, I think the, the biggest thing that, um, that, that Frax um, really kind of did well is uh, Temple, right? Like uh, wherever, whichever that ecosystem that one's in. And so um, Arbitrum, however, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of bridging costs and, and uh, with things that are um, going from, coming from other ecosystems, like people have to you know, go out of their way and, uh, you know, um, it's just not as straightforward. And I think with Frax, it has been, uh, you know, it, it, it does make sense to, to not have a stronger footprint on Arbitrum compared to, uh, say, like Mainnet. Um, but still, I'd say comparing to, I think if you go to, um, if you go to the liquidity pool overview, like curve, curve uh, pool pages, uh, pools page, you, you'll see that Frax actually has, I think, 12 or 15 mil, um, which is, I would say, one of the larger pools on Arbitrum. It, it's not really an issue of uh, how um, there's not a, a lot of money in the pool, but rather it's just that. Uh, there isn't a lot of money uh, overall, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's definitely, you know, uh, received um, a fair bit of success, but if you take a step back, I think uh, uh, just uh, not a lot of money on Arbitrum, especially a stable coin um, uh, volume. So, yeah. What are stable some ways? You... And, uh... Yeah. I guess like what are some ways you could see, you know, Frax expanding their footprint on Arbitrum or like ways you'd like to see Frax do that? I think um, uh, it does depend on how many new projects pop up, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of Frax's, um, one of Frax's, uh, I guess you can say strategy is to support uh, new new projects who are just popping up and uh, giving them support in terms of liquidity, and that's exactly you know how uh, the you know the help that we got. And I think Arbitrum in the current stage, I think DeFi in the in the current phase is just uh, you know these um, liquidity layer protocols. Um, they're just not as prolific as say like, uh, uh, half a year ago um i think you know the 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 strategy definitely works but it's also quite cyclical in the sense that not many new projects are popping up <laughs> so yeah uh, yeah so uh, i you know I, I don't really have any suggestions in mind you know that, that pops in mm -hmm. but um you know, as far as I can, as far as I observe, it's, it's, it's a very valid strategy and it works quite well. Do you see a future one day where the rollup has more liquidity than mainnet? Or do you think mainnet will always have more liquidity than capital than rollups? And I'm thinking like more, like way down the line, like a few years, who knows how long down the line? I think, um, I think that rollups uh, will 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 be more application driven in the sense that if there is a application that really drives a bunch of adoption and it do also requires a lot of liquidity, then it will um, uh, draw a lot of money to that particular rollup. Um, but if if we're talking about people keeping their money. Uh, where they think it's safe, I think it's definitely mainnet in the meantime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's much more of a... Uh, because, you know, um, everybody knows a little bit about consensus and uh, there's always... It's always more secure to be on mainnet and so forth. So... Mm -hmm. That brought up a, a good point that I want to highlight there. If that were to be the case where people feel more confident and comfortable on mainnet mm -hmm. why did vesta decide to build on arbitrum i think it was also a narrative play in the sense that you know there wasn't any um layer two native stablecoin when we were launching and so we wanted to test out this particular thesis 
where we want to be, um, you know, uh, uh, we want to be the the stable coin on these layer twos. And and that was this is also aligned with what I mentioned earlier, which is um, I believe capital on layer two would be more uh, uh, application driven, right? And so um, if our thesis was proven correct, then it would have pulled capital over to layer two um, due to, you know, lower transaction fees, um, easy to more easy to maintain your position, your vault, and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's proven to be somewhat successful, although I would like it to be more successful. Um, but, you know, uh, 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 you know, it's just a, Massive A/B test, and so obviously we we're we're going to main that uh, once mm-hmm. we have two, and you know from there we'll be able to uh, let mainnet users enjoy the better primitive, the better lending protocol primitive that we'll be building. Cool, because I never thought about like you know ETH L one having a separate TAM than all the rollups each having their own TAM. You know that was a. a, a pretty interesting paradigm to, to think about. Yeah. Yeah. I think ultimately it comes down to, you know, the benefits and uh, so forth. And so, you know, Hmm. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I was just thinking about um, like other like types of rollups, like ZK rollups. Do you see, I guess like, are you into the like diving into the tech between like optimistic rollups versus CK rollups? And like something I've been hearing is like, could like one day like optimistic rollups make the switch to become ZK based? Um, like, are you like, what do you think about that? Have you thought about that at all? I think um, I, I'm not very deep into the technicalities of it, um, but I, I've definitely read um, literature around these subjects. And uh, I think uh, uh, back in January of this year, uh, ZK was having its time on crypto Twitter. And Mm -hmm. Arbitrum wrote a post uh, kind of addressing the claim that, you know, ZK rollup is the future and optimistic rollup is not. Um, it It was a pretty good post. I think the most... Um, the the best point that it made was computation intensity uh, required by zero knowledge proof based uh, uh, ecosystems, right? Like in order to verify um, transactions, they need to uh, the, comp- the the source of computation need to um, produce validity proofs, and uh, it's the the machines. That are most efficient to um, uh, to conduct these competition com- computation um, are definitely not your normal Joe kind of laptops uh, and uh, G- you know GTX thirty uh, nineties. You know it's a uh, it's much more cap- it's much more computation mm-hmm. intensive and you know it, it kind of so so it leads to the point of decentralization and so. Now, uh, does that matter? I don't know, right? I, I, I don't know if people even care, but uh, but I think the point is, you know, they have their own use cases. They have their own advantages. Mm-hmm. Got it. And then I wanted to ask for Arbitrum specifically, what are some ways the ecosystem can have the, uh, can increase its stable activity, you think? Well, I think again, it would be activity or application driven. Um, one of the most interesting thing that uh, that made a fairly large impression uh, is the cost of trading on GMX. Uh, I think I think one of the transaction that um, I think it's initializing an account or something that one of the initial action that you would take on GMX, it's 
it costs thirty dollars worth of ETH when ETH is thirty a thousand dollars. Um, so like point, I think point oh three ETH, and that if you bring it onto mainnet, I think that will almost be I don't know like half a ETH or something, <laughs> uh, for one transaction. So um, so you know like um, it definitely has found product market fit in the sense that it's allowing fairly cap uh, computation intensive um, uh, actions to be done uh, that are otherwise extremely burdensome on mainnet. Um, so I think moving forward, it would just be finding further use cases like this one uh, to support for, you know, further um, capital drawing to these layers. Got it. And what do you think is next for, you know, um, Vesta Finance after the V2 launch? Like, what does success look like? Well, I personally actually have uh, a lot of interest in developing um, fintech solutions. So, mm. um, so I've been looking into... Um, you know, what are, what the, the, I was talking to, you know, my, uh, my, my colleague uh, two days ago about this, the way I see, um, the different layers is you can kind of segregate, you can kind of segregate, um, the, the, how money form, uh, into three form, uh, one is securitization and then tokenization and then, um, uh, collateralization. So Vesta lives on the collateralization layer. And um, if we want to um, really dive deeper into making more money fluid, bringing more value fluid, bringing more value to become more liquid, then we could also um, become a player in the tokenization uh, as well as securitization uh, phase. Um, if you look at Circle, they are basically a tokenizer of USD. And, um, you know, if you, if you look at, um, uh, and then if you go one step above, if you're talking about securitization, there's, you know, asset-backed securities, um, uh, mortgage-backed securities, and so on and so forth. I think these are all things that could one day be on chain and be freely tradable and be freely collateralizable. And these are all um you know potential uh, directions of business that we are looking at obviously we would specialize in collateralization first <laughs> and then and then dive deeper into the other layers but um it's all quite interesting that's very cool man and uh just to to wrap up our call here we always like to do a lightning round so i'm going to ask you a series of you know of f fairly quick questions and just give me the first answer that comes to your mind okay Sure. All right, let's get it. What was your first version crypto experience? Like, when did you first touch the chain? Uh, I think I was investing in Monero on Kraken, made a three X, and then lost it all the next trade trying to long Ethereum, long Ether. So, right. Uh, that's, that's still a <laughs> sex, right? That's still a sex, right? When did you first okay, touch well, the chain? I mean, Dex, I think I was trying to buy Crypto Kitties back in 2017. Oh, hell yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That was fun during Thanksgiving. Yeah. And, and then what was your most regrettable purchase? Most regrettable purchase, I think. Uh, uh, I don't have any. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't have any. I actually, don't no regrets. Regrets. I don't have any, you know? Oh, wait, yeah. you bet on Donald Trump this election? Sorry, did you say Donald Trump? Like, did no, you no, no. I, I said I, I don't have any. Oh, no, I, 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 yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't really spend a lot of money, so I don't have any. Oh, uh, <laughs> got it. Okay. Um, uh, now, aside from Frax and Vesta, are there other projects you're excited about? Um. Wow, that's a great question. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I'm really interested in seeing what Uniswap uh, will do with NFT, I would say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And then last question. What do you like to do off-chain? Securitize everything. 
No, I mean, like, what do you like to do, like, uh, in your free time? Touch grass. <laughs> oh, technically, securitizing things are also off chain. But anyway, um, I yeah, uh, we should reword that question. Kid. Yeah, I know. Hello now. <laughs> and this is like the I, second uh, or third time someone's like, oh, like, like something like in secure. Never mind. But like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I like to uh, I like to be active. I do a lot of sports. You know, hike and golf and badminton and whatever. Badminton. Yep. How'd you yep. get to that? I mean, badminton's a pretty, uh, I'd say, a common sport. I am um, mm-hmm. uh, from where I am, so you know, just uh, get a rack and. <laughs> go to I just remember playing that in gym class and how competitive it would get. Yeah. Yep. Same. And, and also just start the name of the party. You know. Yeah. Yeah. The shuttlecock, right? <laughs> the best name ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, Mikey, thank you so much for joining us today, man. This has been a really insightful session on Vesta, Frax, and what it means to be a Frax partner. Thanks for joining, dude. How did thank you, find you. you guys? Definitely learned a lot. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I'm glad to be a Frax partner. I'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah, man. And oh, before you go, how do people get in touch with you and, and support Vesta Finance? People can find our project at vestafinance.xyz, no dash. Uh, or anything um, from there you'll be able to access our twitter and discord um, if you can't wait you can always uh, type in best of finance with no dash either on, on twitter as well awesome thanks man all right talk to you guys soon wow dave what an episode with one of the key frax partners am i right yeah and i expect to see much more of them in the future like i think they're gonna not just become a Big force on Arbitrum, but on plenty of other rollups and chains as well. Yeah, man. I think moving forward, we, we should definitely have more of these Frax partners come on so that other people would know to like partner up with Frax and the kind of value yeah. that Frax can bring to the team. And there's so many different ones. I mean, you have Vesper, you have Staked Out. Uh, if, you, if anybody has any suggestions, leave them in the comments. Um, but yeah, we're definitely going to have more partners on and we should definitely... You know, because Frax doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, it's the partners that makes this expansion possible, especially on chain. Awesome, man. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this podcast. Uh, please remember to follow us at Flywheel Pod on Telegram and Twitter. And you can find me on Twitter at 0x capital underscore K. And then here's Dave's handle. You can find me at DeFi Dave 22 on Twitter. All right. Peace. See you next time.